Welcome again to Next Big Future, the YouTube channel. And this is an offspring of, YouTube, of um, nextbigfuture.com. And if you don't go there, then you're missing out. And I'm Randy Kirk. This is Brian Wong over here. Brian, good morning. Good morning. And, um, the whole idea here is that Brian is the brain and I am Pinky. Is that what we decided? Is that... That's right. Yeah, Pinky the brain. <laughs> That's right. So what happens here is Brian knows about science. My degree in science is psychology. <laughs> and so I try to psychoanalyze. No, that's not true. All right. What we do is Brian explains it. I find out if I understand it. I explain it back to Brian. Brian says, yeah, you're almost got it. And then he tries to make sure that I get it for sure. That's how we play. I hope it's fun for you. If it is, hit like, hit subscribe, hit notify so that you'll be notified of all of these future events coming up. Uh, usually once a week, sometimes more, uh, but generally about once a week. Brian, what do you got this morning? Okay, so we'll go over a lot of uh, different uh, science technology, a fair bit of space. Um, there's also um, some medical and some brain things, so um, an interesting variety of stuff to discuss. All right, well, that throw it now? up there and we'll see what happens. Okay, so um, we've been talking for a while, people who've been following us along, about uh, LK99, that was um, room temperature and room pressure superconductors. So there was a new development with not LK99, but something um, kind of related for room temperature and room pressure superconductors. So this is for um, wrinkled graphene, uh, sorry, sorry, wrinkled graphite, wrinkled graphite. So graphite is what's in your pencil, your lead pencil, right? And they make sheets of it, and then it was um, stuff called graphene, where it's all this carbon stuff and it's carbon nanotubes. So this is a different form of these things. And it is, they, they make it uh, wrinkled. So they got these uh, little, like a fold of paper and you kind of like get it to, to bunch up, right? And mm -hmm. it had a line in it. And um, so they've been working on these kind of materials for a while. Um, normally they have not been able to get to uh, anywhere near room temperature on these things. But here they, they say they have found uh, a global resistance state consistent with room temperature superconductivity. So they, they would find little traces of it, but now they found um, what they feel is the real deal. This is so real that they've it's in, been in a, published in a peer-reviewed journal. Wow. So peer-reviewed means that you scientists does his work, they submit it to a journal where other scientists look at it and say okay yeah we as your panel of judges say you did the right work and we believe you right so it it had to go through that process of, of back and forth and it's in a um uh, quantum advances journal which is uh, rated 4.4 .4, uh, oh. which is about like top 11 percent top you know, ten percent of um, of journals. So not a chump journal, uh, but not the elite journal. Although, to me, um, some some elite journals have reputation. You know, do they really deserve it? You know, is the New York Times really better? You know, that much better than you know the LA Times, Detroit Free Press, right? <laughs> but anyway, so we don't want to go there, Brian. We That's what go there. I understand. <laughs> so, right. But just to give people a sense of it, you know, like yes, people yes. are aware of newspapers, they're aware of stuff, right. and then you know, there's rap and there's whatever. But the the main thing is they've gone through the process of peer review. They, they've gone through a checking yes. process, right? So the the gray. Um, so Brian, let, me, let me let me let me just stop you for a minute because I think you know there's going to be members of the audience that we need to catch them up just a little bit, just a paragraph here. Sure. Superconductivity. Uh, this is something I'll explain it to you, and you tell me if I've still got it right. Sure. So we've got conductive materials like copper. They they are normal, what we th normally think of for conducting electricity, whether that's in our plug in the wall or whether that is in a, a computer. There are conductors that operate at room temperature and that's great but they generate heat and mm -hmm. they're and they tend to be slow well they they're slower than some of these would be and part of the reason they're slow is because of 
they're they're generating all this heat. They're they're losing some of their capability because they are creating a friction. Is that mm -hmm. right? Yeah, the the electric electrical form of friction, the equivalent of that relative to physical wheels rolling or pushing a sled or something like that. So that uh, friction is for physical stuff, and then resistance is for electrical. Yes. And the so copper is a really good metal, one of the best ones for for you know all the metals, um, aluminum and have have really good low resistance things uh, characteristics. And the difference between that and superconductors is about a thousand, ten thousand times, possibly more. Where you go from, you know, ten to the minus eight to ten to the minus eleven, right? I go from like a hundred million to a hundred billion, right? You know, right. for the for this lower level of, of resistance. So um, that is not just this one thousand, ten thousand times, or, or whatever level of you know, resistance drop off. It just it enables um, things to happen that um, that that don't when you when you're a, when you don't have this uh, transition, right? Where it's like it, it went from um, um, straw to gold, right? You know, it's it's, it's like it's the 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 value and the difference is is huge. It all other properties like. Um, keeping out magnetic fields and stuff like that. So the what we've already done when we cool things down to get this effect is the um, uh, some levitating trains. Some um, maglev trains have been built. Um, most high-speed trains just use um, airplane-like construction technique to make a really light, really fast train, still use spinning steel wheels, and stuff like that you just push that technology but then there's other ones where you're literally floating on magnetic field and that is magnetic levitation they're using superconductors right and then also think the magnets for um um super colliders right so so people think okay well what's the difference between my fridge magnet and these things it's like it's this level of a thousand you know a million times more Right. And that's the difference between a thousand million times more. A thousand times, you know, or, or one is fridge magnet, a million times is um, super collider um, magnet accelerating things at the speed of light, right? And, so those these, have to, and, and in order to get there, in order to get that that uh, ma magnetic levitation, or in order to get the kind of speed of of compute or whatever that these that these uh, superconductors do, they have to be uh, done at super low temperatures, or they have to be done under high pressure. Right. And the idea right. is is that that costs money to do that in order to get it to us, and also containment. So you have containment right. issues. You've got super low temperatures that have to be contained, and or the expense of getting them there, as opposed to room temperature, you would have you wouldn't have the expense, and now you'll you'll be able to do all kinds of things that you can't do now. Right, and also the um, the nature of the difficulty of using it. Like when people, some scientists in the recent times have used high pressure, which is basically diamond anvils, right? Mm -hmm. So I have to have two hunks of diamond squeezing together a tiny microscopic piece of something, and then they measure it and they say, oh, look, room temperature is conducting conductivity, but at pressures a million times more than the bottom of the ocean. Right. So it's no one has done anything practical with the, the ultra high pressure. One. They're just saying, I'm exploring this thing so they can then get to the state and then figure out how to then try to make it practical. Right. Right. I, I, I done something impossible before, it, like getting to that temperature, like instead of like the normal accepted um, thing is like minus 140 Celsius or something like that. Right. That's the 133. Kelvin, which is above like above absolute zero, right? So kind of the middle of the road thing. That is the highest temperature superconductor that generally accepted, been made many times. People think, okay, yeah, yeah, we, we can do this. And then there's stuff at um, you know, 60 degrees below that where people have done 
made a lot of it, made it into the magnets, made the other stuff, right? So this, uh, I can I can do it versus I can make it practical and and get it out there, right? You well, know, the cost things. So, so the car, so these carbide, I'm sorry, graphite, these graphite units. Then, can you explain why they're able to do what they're able to do? So <clears throat> they got a very thin piece of, of graphite off of a pencil. They use scotch tape to literally scotch tape to like get a little bit, a thin layer of stuff. And they got it where they did some tricks to it to get these little fine um, wrinkles. So parallel line wrinkles, right? And then they measured it to say, okay, there's what they call one dimensional superconductivity in that less than hair like wrinkle in the thing that, that are shown in the um in this uh, gray thing in the left kind of corner they have it at 200 nanom the whole thing is like um one millimeter across so this is like um 20 times thinner than a hair yeah even hair right so these are really tiny right but as before they were using diamond animals to try and get close to it and then it was question of whether there was fraud also if the if the thing kind of like slipped out you know like i got in this pressure but then you know squeezes out the side you know just like i'm you know got toothpaste and i squeeze a lot of pressure on it it just pops out the side right so the this thing is i'm just going in with my my t-shirt into the lab room temperature room pressure and I'm measuring it and it's right there wow. and i did the thing with with scotch tape right so the Production of it is easy. I can try and figure out how to get better with it. Although, you know, you have to be really creative. But how do I get from something with, you know, scotch tape, getting some wrinkles to a lot of wrinkles, the wrinkles where I want, right? I may have to like stick it over. I have to make a bunch of um, um, maybe a metal mold, you know, with a bunch of really tiny lines on it that I deposit, right? And then I lay my graphene on top of it uh, and or graphite on top of it and then get, you know, a thousand lines of, mm -hmm. of this stuff, right? Because there's issues around scaling it up, but it's um, not unimaginable that you could do it. You'd have to like, you know, a multi-step process to, to get to a lot of lines. Sure. But the other factor is I have a significant amount of one-dimensional superconductivity here that is relatively easy to check. Right. You know, like some other scientists can, can spend his three dollars get his scotch tape <laughs> and then work and do it right so so it's not like it's difficult to check yes it's, it's like when when the people who are you know the scientists who are in the judging panel they can say okay your difficult process of of uh, scotch tape and, and and pencils here i go and then i'm gonna then check the activity you know then you can get to peer review right, right. versus yeah. i must get diamond andals right, right. And, and then do that and it's like you know so it's a um, um, difficult thing to change. anyway so you can see how that would be faster to develop but it is one dimensional but the interesting thing about the one dimensional you know for, for me uh is that the lk99 which was the, the the thing of the fall last year july august where the south koreans said okay yeah we got um um room temperature superconductivity but it's probably has one dimensional superconducting effects. And that's the same thing that the Chinese researchers who did some replication are saying where they used um, LK99, but with some sulfur in it. So if you have a ring of um, carbon, you know, carbon likes to go into these C6 rings. So if I swap out uh, one of the carbons and I pop in a copper, maybe I need to line up like a series of like things, each of the rings line up and the copper is all along one line. Right. So I got like a series of loops of co carbon and then I get the, the copper all on the one line that would be one dimension. Right. So that'd be difficult to get a lot of it. Right. I'd, I'd, although by swapping out and say, OK, the, if each of the carbons is reacted to a sulfur, five of them, and then only one is not, then the only place the copper could swap in is that one spot. Hmm. But then I got to get the alignment stuff. So that's why I think we're making progress on the LK99, on the other stuff, is because they're figuring out how to get this one dimensional stuff and get more of it to happen, right? So, and then if you do on thin film, 
maybe it's easier to get alignment that because the thin film seems to get better results on the lk99 so i'm talking about lk99 not this um, right, right graphite thing right so but the the interesting thing is that both of them are talking about one-dimensional superconductivity both of them are talking about materials with a lot of uh, carbon in there um the carbon here is interesting because there have been a lot of different forms of the of graphene, which is like basically a rolled up sheet of this stuff, but um, in a long straw, right? Where they've done stuff and they've tried to get that to be stimulating. But they, where they got to slightly higher temperatures, not to room temperature, but to better temperatures, was something called magic angle. So basically, they had to like get the thing, the, the graphene, like the straw, to bend, and then once they got it to, um, you know only a number 53 degrees mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. 53, okay and then suddenly got a lot of superconductivity. so mm -hmm. the form factor of these things because they've worked with crumpled up graphite and other stuff like that before they've had wrinkles and stuff before but it's like getting them just right mm. there, there is a a lot of it must be just right and then to think i think the realization that hey one-dimensional superconductivity if i play around with the angles and wrinkles and stuff, and then really just measure the spot. And then not like, did I get, make the whole thing become superconducting, but just did I make that segment right. of superconducting is what it seems to be working. I, I I believe that the evidence around these things is um, increasing, right? That they're- Getting close. Yeah, getting close. But these guys say full up measurement for this, um, line, these lines, parallel lines of um, wrinkled graphite, they're saying, according to the charts, saying full up um, low resistance, this is it. They say global resistance state, which means a thousand times, 10,000 times better than copper is right there. It's not all over it, but it's in that little, these little lines is, they're saying the evidence is, is clearly that that's happening. So again, okay. consistent similar to LK99. You know, is it uh, conclusive that, you know, both of them are right, that both of them something? No, but it's, um, um, again, accumulating evidence to support the fact that um, LK99 got to something first with uh, one-dimensional superconductivity. Again, a lot of work to figure out how do I make a lot of it? How do I get the other properties right? You know, it, this, this can be... Um, difficult and 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 challenging but it's a uh, both important developments and it's um reinforcing the right. the uh, evidence okay all right very cool okay oops so elon musk and you, you've already covered, covered this on your other channel um and i said they were the first human with a neural link implant so for people who have not been paying attention to that the thing on the right is you know, size of what? So a dollar, but you know, thicker. Um, and then you got these um, op optical fibers. So those would be put, you'll, you'll remove a section of the skull and then, or like open it up and then put this device into contact with the brain. And they see that the brain, the human's brain, the skull on the, um, on the life made the skull transparent. And then is looking at a cursor. So basically they have it connected so that the readings from the, the, the brain connections um, for the, as a brain computer interface. So it's connected, the device is connected to computer so that the person can then, um, you know, if they're paralyzed, can um, type out messages, can move a cursor and, and do other things. But so, they would have to train to do it. Go ahead. So, so my understanding, I don't know if you're going to have more pictures, but yeah, they have a few more pictures. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's go let's go ahead then. So this is showing the the person's transparent brain, and then you see the kind of like a, a bit of a iPhone, and then connecting the words. So they basically they've connected. I sh should try and get get a better picture of it, but that is one thing there. And then you have a surgical robot, which does the delicate putting in the two hundred little fibers that go in because because the that black connection um, is just to hold all these little threads, optical threads, uh, but then they need to be um, 
connected, you know, fed into to the brain to connect to what needs to be connected. And this so, all, and this takes place, if I understand it right, the, the, this uh, surgical robot puts these threads in really pretty fast and it doesn't take a lot of time. Right. And it puts them in basically one at a time. And each one of those threads is going to a different part of the brain based mm -hmm. on what they've, uh, uh, what they've pre pre assumed or pre uh, recognized as if we put these threads in these various parts of the brain, we'll be able to connect neurologically to the function that we're shooting for. So they might be shooting for a function that has to do with uh, a person who's paralyzed. They might be shooting for a function that has to do with somebody who has lost their sight and can't be, and, and this loss of sight can't be solved any other way. Or they mm -hmm. might just be shooting for the function of being able to have this person play a video game without hands, <laughs> just be yeah. able to think the video game into action. Is that, do I have that pretty close to the right? Right, right, yeah. So, so yeah, so so your connective functions and the pain upon the condition, because right now it's, it's approved for um, ALS and for um, spinal cord injuries. Okay. So again, a paralyzed person or someone with some brain um, dysfunction disease. So it's going to be treating um, people with those those conditions, other kind of medical conditions until, you know, they perfect it. They're basically saying, so that's the approval they have from the FDA. That they're, they're working on that way. Um, and then the ultimate vision Elon's talked about is that um, if you can get more and more connections to between the device and the human brain, then you could increase the um, the bandwidth, the rate of communication. Like right now, if I type words into a computer, I can get maybe, you know, if I'm really good, I can get like 150, 200 words a minute. So with this thing, potentially the communication speed might be, you know, 10,000 times, a million times more, right? So then you're really um, uh, having a lot of communication to with your brain to computers and to the outside devices. So, but right now, just um, if I'm two words, three words per minute, but I'm paralyzed, I went from zero to three words, right? Right. So then you can get up to a hundred words, 200 words. And then when you get to, you know, 500 words, then it's like, okay, I'm, I got five times the bandwidth communication between, you know, my brain and the outside computer. Right. You know, the ultimate goal is to get to like, you know, a million times better. Right. So that you have these really tight connections to to computer devices. So basically we become, you know, like in science fiction, you know, the good Borg or, you know, in Star Trek, the Borg or the, you know, some kind of cybernetic thing. In science fiction, we have these things where someone's, you know, had the mechanical thing that's, that's uh, connected to computers. That would be the uh, the end state vision. But you're going through helping people with disease because you're not as good as that. I can right. type faster than I can talk to this thing. I'm more precise. But the people who are being helped, you know, need that help. If I can just get the, the bridge between the spinal cord and, and the brain, then they can start walking again, right? You know, even if they're stumbling or something like that, they, it's, again, from nothing to something. To something. So yes. Yeah. And this could be a long fade. It could be difficult. You know, it could take 10 years, 20 years to get to thousands and thousands of patients, but you're helping people. You're, um, you have, you may have an end goal in mind, but the next 10 years might be just, um, better and better treatment of for people who have you know various kinds of major injuries right either injuries or or, or uh, disease disease or maybe even some kind of uh, d dysfunction from birth and then and then uh elon's eventual hope here or his his the 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 bud of the idea came from the from the place where as AIG, as general artificial intelligence, uh, becomes, AGI, yes. AGI becomes a thing, then you have a, a circumstance where bots or machines could be smarter than humans, and then all of a sudden you've got a, a, a potential problem. Uh, he's very worried about that. So this, the idea here was, if if this becomes an actual extension of our brain, uh, then we can keep up. Because the 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 advances in AGI 
that would be in your phone or in your other devices can be hooked into you through this I implant. And now you are at the same level uh, a a as they are. Right, right. Um, there are a hundred other ways to do brain computer interfaces. So you can do it um, with, you know, reading the magnetic field. So you wear kind of a like skull cap and you have electrodes and sensors and stuff like that. There's, like I said, many other technologies to try and crack this, this problem. Um, but they're, you know, working toward this particular method, which, you know, we have not, you know, I've seen any of the other methods achieve um, helping someone with a spinal cord injury or, um, you know, there's some more crude methods. Like I think um, Stephen Hawking before he died had some connection where he could, I think he was using his tongue to um, to operate some sensors that would then connect to, to a joystick. Yeah, like and, there are, and, and there are some that are using his this method also of having probes that go into the brain and hook up with the neurons, but they're very thick, they're very clumsy, uh, they're mm -hmm. very intrusive. Yeah. What Elon, again, what Elon has in mind here, if I understand it correctly, is he wants to do something that is, that can be done on an outpatient basis that would mm -hmm. cost about the same as a uh, as a um, as uh, uh, what, what do you call the the eye thing that you do the uh, LASIK about the cost about the same as LASIK be about as intrusive as LASIK um, and that we, would be something that people would just go in and have done uh, as easily no not we don't easily go in and have LASIK I haven't had mine done <laughs> you're wearing your glasses I, I had LASIK done actually oh did I, you actually not old okay. I, I basically had uh, you know. Had um, LASIK done basically like uh, 25 years ago. Okay. And um, so that LASIK is they take a slice of, of the top of your eye, eyes, and then they hold the flap over and then they laser underneath to shape, change the shape of your eyes. Right. And basically, I didn't need glasses and I actually can still operate without glasses, but now because I'm older, you know, the, the reading glasses and some other stuff, it's like, you know, you still deteriorate because you got to perfect vision i did a perfect vision for a while um and then um age yeah, so, takes over <laughs> yeah and but then you know over time it it, it um, deteriorates right and then also i wear the glasses again you know it makes me look smart again so oh, i see there you go that's the i yeah. knew that i knew there was something <laughs> yeah right okay, so, so anyway, um, that's, but that's his goal is to make it uh make it something that is practical something that uh that folks can can actually take advantage of right right and um so it's, it's again, it's a monetizable path where because you need to keep getting, you know, the big goal could take many billions of dollars, right? Hundred million dollars to, to achieve that that ultimate goal. And the device that we're seeing now, two hundred threads, probably in the thing, you may end up needing like a million connections, <laughs> a million connections. So then, achieving that, you know, again, you need to keep having. Uh, a profitable path to to getting better and better right. and by helping a million people five million people with um spinal cord or other kind of injuries disease and stuff like that on the brain disease part it could be like you know 10 million 100 million people right and if i do that at the price of lasik in that ballpark you know ten thousand dollars per um condition right then if it's a million people, that's $10 billion. If it's 10 million people, it's $100 billion. So it becomes a um, a major thing. And you're helping people. You, you need to, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, oops. Uh, okay, I, th I thought I had another one. I, I had another one where I had the, the, the exploding thing of that thing. I got the wrong picture. So next topic is um, there's something called a quantum drives. Um, so there's quantized inertia. So um, that those theories, quantized inertia, has been around since the nineteen eighties, and they um, it competes with um, the dark matter theory of of um, of um, gravity and physics. So dark matter is where a bunch of astronomers say, look at the speed of the galaxies rotating. And it's it's incorrect. I, I estimate how many stars, the mass in the galaxy, and the, my result is this wrong that there's things aren't rotating right at large scales. So, so they then 
uh, say, based on our calculations, about 80% of matter is stuff we can't see. It's not anything in stars, it's not anything in planets, nothing else, you know, dust, it doesn't add up, right? When we run the numbers, it doesn't add up, right? So then we they, they theorize that there are a, a kind of matter that um, does not reflect light, that um, just has this gravity effect. It can't be regular particles, right? They, they were kind of like eliminated all those other options over the decades that they've been doing this stuff. So then they try and find these other particles because they're saying, okay, it must be something about particles. So we, you know, theorize what it is. So they spent billions of dollars looking at that and they haven't found anything, right? They haven't found any new particles, right? So then the um, quantum inertia people say, you know, much like when we shrink things down from Newtonian gra planets and stuff moving down, when we get to a certain level, we get to quantum effects, quantum mechanics. Right, which is the atom behaves differently than the planet. Right, right. It, it's, it's doing stuff different because it's at the small scale. Right. So they say that inertia uh, is the same same deal. That it's at at the big scale, you know, broad range is behaving like this. But then when you get down to the small level, tiny tiny levels, then it we go to a different regime it goes to what they say the quantum effect so you, you have like a straight line and then down here it's different um and they have um examples so their breakpoint also generates the same um galaxy rotations all that kind of stuff and it also scales down to when i have two stars about um nine thousand times further away from each other than the earth is from the sun right really far apart so 30 times further away than Pluto. In the uh -huh. Uh -huh. They're still orbiting each other, uh -huh. right? And the speed of orbiting for these distant binaries um, doesn't, doesn't line up with, um, you know, the dark matter thing. Because, like, there's no dark matter between these things causing this thing. Because dark matter needs to be at, you know, galaxy-wide scale. Right? I see. So then the, the, the rotating binary thing lines up with uh, quantized inertia. Right, where they say, because the, the gravity effect is so tiny, because they're so far apart, right? Right, right. So far apart. So then, that's where they say the the break point where where things start behaving differently is ex shown by these rotating stars that are really far apart, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The speed and stuff. So they can explain galaxies and they can explain the the rotating binaries, which the um, dark matter people can't, right? Anyway. For this thing is the people who are theorizing that quantized inertia say we can make propulsion out of this thing that we can these effects these tiny effects right we can figure out how to leverage that to get space propulsion and and a private group um has spent i'm guessing a few million bucks has put up a cubesat into space. SpaceX launched it in November and they were letting it uh, have the gases and stuff leak out. Um, and they're going to turn it on probably in the next few weeks. Hmm. Right. And they have two drives on it. One, you know, represented by that um, block of wood or something like that, or the SG hunk of metal. And then another one below. So they have two different drives in there. And they're at, um, 0.25 uh, millinewtons of thrust and 0.65 millinewtons of thrust. So it's tiny, but it's it's like a weak Hall effect thruster. So there are these Hall effect thrusters, you know, sho shoving out ions and things, and they're very very weak, but they're super efficient with fuel, like you know, ten times, twenty times more efficient with fuel. Um, but they still need like for this level of power, they need about 20 watts. To get it, this thing needs one watt, right? Mm -hmm. So one watt to achieve this thing, but it doesn't need fuel. So if I run the super efficient ion drive for a year or two years, I'm still going to get up to 100 kilograms, a ton of fuel, right? Per year, right? So I still end up being big. This thing, because it doesn't use fuel, doesn't use propellant, would keep running so long as the solar panels or the, or the nuclear 
energy source works. So long as they got electricity, this thing will keep running. So you could have it run for, you know, 20 years, and then the tiny acceleration stacks up to get to high speed. If I have a chemical rocket, it has way more thrust. Like as you see the massive power of the SpaceX Starship or the other rockets launching. Sure. But after a few minutes, they're done. I've used up all my fuel. I'm wow. done. So it's like the tortoise and the hare. The hare sprints ahead for a few minutes, gets to really high speed. But then the tortoise, a really, really slow tortoise, can keep going faster and faster for, for a year, 10 years, 100 years. And then you get to insane speeds, right? Even after a year, you're getting to insane speeds. Mm. Um, so the importance of uh, this would be that um, let's say they turn it on in the next month. Right. In a month's time, maybe two months' time, this thing, this satellite, without any other propulsion, without any of the fuel, would then move from 320 miles above the Earth's surface to 380 miles, maybe more. Right. So I've changed orbit on this right. thing. And I've done it cheaper than the cheaper and lighter by 20 times, 100 times than the Hall effect thrusters. Because the Hall effect thrusters are, this thing weighs like 200 grams, it's like a half a pound for, for a device. Mm -hmm. And the, the Hall effect thruster for this power level would be about like 20 kilograms, right? Or 10 kilograms. So it'd be about like, um, uh, you know, 100 times more heavy, right? Yeah. So, but the thing is, this technology, just the first crack at it, you know, they they can then figure out how to make it smaller and smaller down to like, you know, one gram, two grams, something like that. Wow. So, but then the, um, so they have, it's stacking, where it's like the red red arrow, where it's going down, they two operate and they push down. So that would mean that they would, um, you could add the effect. If I make many of these devices, I can add it up. So that means like if I can't figure out how to get beyond one watt of power and getting tiny effects, um, then, but I can stack it up. Right. I can make an array of these things, a thousand by thousand, I get a million of these things. And then suddenly I have thrust equivalent to a SpaceX rocket and I just keep going. No fuel limit. It just goes. So then if this thing stacks, but one, if it works, things change. It means that the dark matter is substantially wrong and that this other theory, and the theory that they have for this thing may not be right. Yeah. But the effect is right. real. Right? <laughs> so, so they've shown, okay, it worked in this lab, but people say, okay, maybe you made mistakes. But if it's up there and it moves the satellite, right? Then it's like something moves the satellite. Maybe your theory is right, maybe something else is right, but we now have your theory is close enough that you're able to figure stuff out and, and right. make something move. Dark matter people, they're still looking for a particle. None of their thing comes out with any product, right? This thing would be a real product that could like replace all of the ion drives on all the Starlink satellites, right? SpaceX could say, okay, I'll buy, you know, a thousand of these things. And then DARPA has a, they already funded a million three for another scientist to try and figure this stuff out. Hmm. This other group, you know, leveraged that work and has that guy as an advisor to them, but they came up with, with engineering innovations on it. Um, so DARPA will, will follow up with $17 million per year. You know, that's ready to go, just waiting for this thing to kind of work. And then there's um, three other groups working on this, one associated with NASA and another group that want to launch CubeSats as well. So, so even if it doesn't work, there'll be more tries right. to get there. because it's like, it's, it's still, you know, highly experimental. Right, right, right. But it, there's enough promise based on what's happening in the lab. They say, I'm, I want to try and get to work. And by doing it in space, they would, if it works, it's conclusive. Like if I, I can have a, a hundred really great lab results. Mm -hmm. And then people say, yeah, so what? I don't believe you. You missed something. You didn't do the work right. If I have something move in, in space, there's like that alone is useful. Right, right. Yeah. So now is the, uh, Ryan, the, I think I, 
you know, understand this at some level, uh, not a very deep level, <laughs> but okay. but um, if uh, if this works in space, if it works as a thruster, which would allow you to move satellites more efficiently, effectively in space, is this literally something that could create the thrust to move vehicles on Earth, uh, to move rockets into space? I mean, is that the kind of thing we're talking about or is this really on such a small level that it needs to be in a vacuum or a near vacuum? If the theorist is correct about how, how this would work, so, so if it works and if the theory is broadly correct right. and if it stacks, if, if, the, if the two thrusters work together, right? right then I can, if I take the 200 gram thing, right? Mm -hmm. And I make it um, a milligram, I make it nanoscopic, right? right. Where it's like, um, you know, two, two nanometers apart. I get the same effect because I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm gonna be hundred nanometers across. I'm, I'm shoving in a laser beam or I'm using this dielectric, you know, sandwich thing. And the effect is still there, even though I made it smaller. Right. And the reason that they, have some confidence that that could be is in their a few hundred lab tests. I think they have tried to shrink it mm. and gotten, you know, it's not like once I make it smaller, the effect gets way smaller. The effect seems to stay relatively constant. I see. So if I can then shrink it down then and make a lot of them, you know, like, a, like I have a hundred billion transistors right. on, on a iPhone. Thing. Right. I make a hundred billion of these things on that, then, then yeah, that that things can can then be part of launching stuff to 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 space. Uh -huh. It also means that, but if I can launch up to space, that means I can get three Gs, two Gs, uh -huh. you know, two times the gravity force, right. right? If I have one G of reactionless thrust, or right. not reaction, but but no propellant thrust, right? So this invisible effect giving me thrust that can cancel out gravity. So not even three Gs to launch it to to orbit. Right. Although you know, just anything over one G would, would launch because it just start floating up. Right. If I'm neutral, that means I can make these wafers with the hundred trinity things like chips all across the bottom of my um table. And now my table floats. Yeah. I got anti-gravity. Yeah. Equivalent I bought gravity. It's not I'm cancel out gravity. I just have created force that cancel out gravity. Right. So then if you were to mass produce it, then my aircraft carrier could be like floating. Right, floating around. <laughs> right. So, and they can also increase it beyond that. So um if it scales like that, right? Or we can increase the power from one watt to you know a kilowatt or megawatt you know, right. either way to scale or a combination of those two things, or we increase the effect, then basically, even in the, a lot of things don't happen, but I can at least get a million to work together. We're basically going to Alpha Centauri in like 12 years. I see. <laughs> we're, 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 we got anti gravity. We basically go completely science fiction as we can make, you know, a million of these things. A million plus is basically right, right, right. into some small thing. It's like, you know, Katie bar the door, you know, my, you know, call me Spock or start, you know, Captain Kirk. It's like, you I'll call you Captain Kirk and me Spock. And then we're, we got a Star Trek world, you know, it's uh, not quite warp drive, you know, but it's like right, we're right. doing stuff that, you know, you know, all the, um, some of the, the dreams of science fiction just starts happening. So, so but it's, it has to work. Right. right. If it doesn't work, nothing happens, right? So the interesting thing about this is that we can all kind of watch it. Right. Because NORAD has satellite tracking. This is being tracked right now. It's going at 4.72 miles per second because okay. in normal orbit. Right. So then if that thing starts going to 4.73, 4.74, next month, month after, 4.75, then you say it, it's... it's uh, Confirmation. Something's happening. It's thing that major stuff is going to happen, right? Um, for people who say that um, maybe they faked it or something like that, they went up on a ride share with SpaceX. Right. So three hundred fifty thousand dollar ride share with SpaceX. SpaceX doesn't launch black boxes, right? 
you got to give them detailed engineering plan of what the heck you've launched. Yeah, yeah. Because I, one, you could stick a bomb on there. I don't want a bomb blowing up my other. Right, right. Two is you could accidentally make something with the bomb. Right. You know, just like um, Apollo 13, where um, oxygen tank leaked and then, you know, right. racked stuff up. You know, like space and, and rockets, a lot of dangerous stuff. So they know exactly what they launched. Plus, SpaceX pretty much is going to have a monopoly on space in right. like over half the satellite. So they're, they're the main customer, right? If you can do it and then you can and reproduce it, then you're selling 10,000, 100,000 sure. to start with, sure. right? So they're the main customer. So you want to show them. And also DARPA, you know, some Confirm. stuff related before, they're waiting in the wings to look at this thing. Sure. They also will not accept the black box. Right. You know, they want to, to see the thing work. And then if it does, then, you know, $17 million per year, just beginning, you're going to get a billion dollars. So. Very, very, very fascinating. Yeah. So within two months, so the, 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 the reason that I'm so excited and interesting about the thing is that, you know, unlike many other scientists, science experiments and tests, this thing is visible. I can we'll just watch NORAD. I have to wait for and rely to someone to write a paper for it. I can just look at that thing, go to the online site and see whether this thing is starting to speed up or not over the next few months. Yeah. So that's great. And then two is if it works, it's like, you know, I'm not counting on the theory, but you know, it can do all kinds of stuff. And then energy, transportation, everything starts changing because you can apply it also to energy. Sure, sure, sure. Absolutely. Ah. Um, so yeah, so they have to explore why it works. And I say, so once it does work, there's, there's work to, to really confirm the theories, to confirm the boundaries, because you can't assume that you build a run it for years. You can't assume that, um, you'll get all the propulsion because it's, it's an, it's an entirely new science right. experiment. You don't know how it really works. So you have to figure that out and that'll be important for figuring out how to make it better. Sure. Sure. Um, the reason that they must uh, turn on the next month or so is um, one I heard from the scientists who said that they can turn on the next month or two, talk to them directly, uh, direct message via Twitter. And the other thing is that off the shelf CubeSat parts, if I buy the, the parts and do it, it will work for about a year in space. Mm -hmm. If I'm lucky, it could last three years, four years, but um, percentage wise, I can't be sure of that. So that I need to really complete my science experiment, ideally within six months to nine months, right? Because the off-the-shelf parts will break, highly likely. So then they can't say, oh, I'm not going to turn this thing on for a year because then that, that thing could have, could have broken, you could be done, and you can't do anything, right? Because the thing break, so. Sure. Um, so here's some um, things related to something that started happening during the COVID pandemic, which is continuing. So most of the COVID um, um, deaths and stuff have dropped off a lot. But then there is um, something called excess deaths from um, um, all causes. So these excess deaths are based upon insurance actuaries and scientists who do actual science saying, based upon what happened between 2015 and 2019, we would expect this level of, of deaths from various kinds of diseases. And in 2023, you can see that the dark purple line in the middle is floating around from 7%, mostly around 10% and up to 12%. That's the United States excess deaths, right? Japan is up around 25%, up down to those 14 and up above 20. So it's even worse in Japan. And then uh, the United Kingdom is also around the level of the United States, around 10%, 10-15% ex excess deaths. So these are countries with, you know, good medical systems, you know, good tracking of the causes of death and all those kinds of things, quality data. But this excess death thing has been tracked by the scientists since the beginning of the pandemic. Right. right. Saying, and they were saying before during the command, oh, maybe because of things going on, because of the medical system being messed up during the right. pandemic that was causing this this thing. 
but it is um you know they've eliminated that you know in in the last year right so why is this a big deal one is from 2020 beginning of the pandemic to 2022 um this statistically is coming up with about 15 million nearly 15 million excess deaths hmm. this is 5.2 5.5 million for covid death okay so we're looking at an effect of nearly three times as big hmm. right and it's continuing even when covid deaths have dropped now uh not quite as uh strong some of the effects although it can vary by country because the the japan had almost no excess deaths at the beginning of the pandemic and this is kind of increasing over the four years for japan so the, the distribution rates are different for each country okay. but it is pretty much all countries are are having right so again it goes to you know like what is the cost and it's important right. to figure this out because um you know, if it's, you know, people not getting enough sun, health, other stuff, although those kinds of things happen all the time sure. and don't have an effect this big, right? So some of the things related to heart disease, the heart disease um, deaths have increased in the UK 100,000 more than people would have expected, again, based on what was happening in 2015, 2019, right? To have 100,000 more deaths. So, you know, 30,000, 40,000 more heart related deaths in the UK um than they were expecting. So a hundred thousand more heart deaths is um the US with three hundred thirty million people has normally about two point two, two point three million deaths. Um so this thing with plus ten percent, we look at another two hundred thousand some deaths. The UK with sixty some million people would normally have say 500,000 deaths, 100,000 extra heart deaths is, a, is you know, 40,000 a year yeah. is, is a big deal, right? And it's happening to people that you wouldn't expect it to happen to. You know, Which younger is. people, mm -hmm. uh, 20s, 30s, and 40s. Wow. And it's not like I'm not getting into the hospital to get treatment for something that I, should, I know about. If something right. new is happening that the doctors weren't expecting, and then you're basically having a heart attack and dying, because I didn't expect you in that condition to have this this heart thing. So I wasn't filtering for it. And right. when, okay, I can just give you the heart medication, put you on an exercise program, and you'd be good. It's like, it's stuff that's happening that is not. So it's, it's like we all, if all of our health has changed because of uh, COVID, vaccines, whatever has happened over the last few years, then it, we need to, to know that right so that, okay if now 10 percent of the time something new is happening we're more at risk for something that's going to cause a heart attack we're more at risk we need to know be able to predict this person would have that that, that death we can't have been able to predict those forty thousand people right in, right in, the two hundred thousand people in in the united states right so if we have 10 percent shift in our um, all of our health conditions then we have to have new tests new um protocol to say yeah. we need to treat them because we're not able to get ahead of this thing so brian i know that a lot has been made i mean it's not just a lot has been made we know that part of the reason why the uh, statistical age average age of death in the united states has been going up uh, going down rather people have been dying younger on an average over the last several years for the first time Basically, in 100 years, the number has been going lower as opposed to higher. Um, a lot of that has been blamed on opioid uh, deaths. Um, are they, they, they must be counting that for a portion of this. And could the opioids also be contributing to the heart problems? Um, they could be contributing to the heart problems. But the again, when they do the autopsy, they would say, yeah. you know, fentanyl deaths versus other deaths so the people who have done this research you know 100 page studies yes a lot of them you know they're not foolish they would say okay yeah opioid death gun deaths car accidents right. that i understand that right this is something else and it's increasing the heart deaths and the kidney deaths 
other things. It's not just heart disease. It's like a, a bunch of other things that are happening, right? right? But it's it's stuff where we thought we had a handle on predicting right. that, and then now we don't. So the the if you look at this at a at a broad level, so step, stepping up from looking at country by country and trying to get the details and trying to sort that out. In terms of the broad effect of this thing, the only time you see a big bump up in overall world deaths, right, uh, across like 80 years ago, was like around 1961, 62, right? Huh. What happened there? Uh, about 30 million to 40 million people in China died of starvation because Mao Zedong messed up the agriculture where he didn't have proper farmers running it. He had people who were ideologically right. you know, communist running farms and they didn't grow the food right. Um, and so then that made people, you know, starved, right? Over two, three years. Uh -huh. So then you see this, you know, bump up 40 million deaths, 40 million, 50 million, two, three years, and then back down. Here we're seeing, you know, 55, 50 million deaths up to 65 and then hanging up there at this higher level. So we it should have been a smooth curve, as we expect, and then now it's gone up, right? At a level that is, you know, globally, perhaps 3 million, 5 million a year beyond what we expect. Wow. So it is important that we figure out and figure out how to prevent it. We, you know, shouldn't just accept that. Yeah, yeah. So, that, you know, so other than heart, other than heart, and opioids? Do they have other things on the list that they're looking? I know no, no, this is not not looking opioids in this thing. It's not looking opioids. It's okay. It's, it's they, they eliminated opioids as I see. As everything. It's, it's categorized out. So it's um like I said, um, <clears throat> heart disease, kidney disease, cardiovascular, um, you know, perhaps strokes and stuff like that. But in population and and. Surprising, yeah. surprising so, demographic. Surprising and, and also, or surprising at the rate that right. it's happening. Right, right. So it, it is something that, you know, should be, you know, there are a lot of people looking at it. You know, so it's not like, you know, you know, just me, like it's, it's like our world and data is tracking the stats, right? It's like, you know, they track, you know, coal and whatever pollution, they're tracking this as a thing. Economist Magazine is tracking this as a thing. The scientists publish, you know, dozens of papers a week trying to figure it out. You know, people are trying to figure it out, but it's, it's like for the level of problem that it is, I think more effort should go into it uh, to figure out what's so going the, on. So, so inter one thing of interest that pops into my mind, which probably has absolutely nothing to do with it, but when I notice that Japan is further along on this curve than the United States or our, our United Kingdom, um, all three places are experiencing a drop off in the amount of sexual activity uh, among both men and women. In particular, in Japan, this is, you know, a decade or two decades ahead of what's taking place in the other Western nations. Um, I mean, literally where the where there's uh, sex between, uh, you know, Males and females has dropped down in in Japan to to crazy levels, right. uh, and it's now starting to be now it's starting to show up also in the United States and other Western countries. Um, obviously, humans are designed to procreate and to and to have uh, <laughs> sex between men and women. Uh, I wonder if maybe there's something going on there in a really deep sense in terms of the biology. So I only picked these three countries just because um you know they're more um um known to people yeah, right? right and the uk has been doing a lot of work the medical system getting good information right but when you look at the uh, papers that, that look at this whole thing it's across you know all countries interesting wow so you know belgium France, Germany, you know, I can show you the, the list. You can, well, no, but I'd be, I'd be interested to know for the purposes of this idea, it'd yeah. be interesting to know what is happening, let's say, in um, uh, equatorial Africa where births and, and sex are still normal. 
Um, as so, a, so unfortunately, question. the I can we can look at that. I can see you know because I have the table after we we have this call. I can you know we do a follow up in the next weekly thing to to go over that. Sure. Uh, but they have the tables that, that go over it. The problem with the African countries and the other really poor countries is that their uh, medical system is terrible. Their autopsies are terrible. Right. So you don't you die. You may not get, get any treatment. You may just have gotten you know some you know aspirin or nothing. You know and just and then you die. And then okay, oh, I think I died. And then they, they, you you have no analysis of right, that. right, 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 right. So the problem is their data is terrible. Yeah. Right. They'll they'll count up more bodies and then and then the other thing is that um, for some of the countries they don't even do a census they don't count their people right the reason they don't do that is because they don't want to count the minorities which may be growing mm -hmm. to upset the um political balance i see there, right so so then you know almost no medical records not even account to the people so i can't even say you know are there five million or ten million more people there Right. You know, I have no expectation because you haven't counted people for 30 years. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I don't know how many people are in the country. So how can I know how many extra deaths there have been? Because I didn't, I didn't have a good number on your people. Right. So that's the problem with some of these countries. And it, it, it's a blind spot for a global health issue is that, you know, you'd want to run these tests. So you can only go down to a certain level. Maybe you can go down to Portugal or Brazil, a poorer country, but something that's still has a, a enough good, good quality medical system yeah I mean, because mm -hmm. as as crazy as it may seem let's you know we know that psychology the the thing that i did actually study we know mm -hmm. that your psychology your um uh your your desire to live let's ca even call it uh you know uh all of these things impact your physical self if you have no partner you have no you know you no plan to have children it's going to affect your prospects in terms of what you think about life in the future it's going to maybe cause you to be purposeless you're going to be lonely all of these things are things that could definitely be affecting our physicality and so that's kind of what i'm looking at here are we get we know that there's a loneliness issue we know there's a sex issue. We know there's a no children issue. We know people are not getting married or not are getting married later. We know people are not growing up. They're staying with, you know, living in their parents' basement until they're 27. We know all these things are happening. We know people are stuck playing the video games instead of actually maturing and going out and becoming, act, you know, uh, all of those things might be affecting, uh, you know, the physiology of these young people that, should be living fine, but maybe they're just, they just uh, don't have enough to live for, so to speak. So I think the, the issue is that um, <clears throat> the number of people um, dropping dead, right, right, at a young thing, you know, their activity level has gone back, went back to normal, right? Like no, people aren't, you know, the fraction of people being recluses, you know, hiding away is not that high, right? Mm -hmm. you know, we no longer know anyone in our uh, circle of acquaintances who is hiding away. People could still, I'm wearing the mask, I'm still concerned about that, but they're not hermits, yes. right? And so someone, and you can say, okay, this case, this case, this active person, um, 30 years old, you know, Drop, drops dead suddenly from a heart attack. Yeah, from right, right? right. It's like, we know that that did happen before. Congenital heart defect, other things, right? right. But then we eliminate the congenital heart defect and it's like, you know, why did it happen? You know, yes, this person overweight, but then statistically, we don't expect this number and now we're getting this far bigger yes, number. Yes, yes, yes. Right? So it's, um, you know, it's the excellent, the trivial the simplified explanations, theories, over four years, we would have said, oh, yeah, it's this, right? right. Or this combination of that, right? right? So the the reason that, you know, thousands of scientists and doctors 
haven't been able to figure out is because it is not um not as uh as simple as what we would hope we right. want to explain it we want to say okay i right. want to say okay well obviously because of this and so i right. have to work right unfortunately no it's it's um it's resistant to that kind of thing because it's been gone for four years and, and thousands of people are looking at it yeah well this is yeah. definitely something we need to follow up on yeah so um some other thing is it's not science but it's a technological thing um people who track the um, planes uh, in the united states have found and they track military bases have found that the kc-135 activity increased a bunch yesterday so kc-135 are the refueling planes you can see in the bottom uh here that that plane that <clears throat> looks like um a smaller uh, boeing plane it is made by boeing and it, it would have the little nozzle to refuel so basically it, it's the the theory is that um because three soldiers were killed in jordan uh, at near the intersection of jordan syria and iraq that the us is is finally going to start um fighting the uh, backers of iran the houthis and stuff in a major major way they sent some uh, navy ships over there before but now if you're looking at dozens of kc-135s then a significant chunk 25 percent of the air force 50 percent of the air force is going over to the middle east and then we're going to have um, major activity over there just um yep. expecting to happen um and here so basically it's gonna be like a, a new war um so or the expanded war um in there so the tower 22 in the middle here near the corner of jordan iraq and syria is where um a drone attack occurred on the U.S. base, and we'll discuss drones in a and for military stuff in a follow-up video related to the future of war. Um, but basically, the the, the Americans uh, at that base um, mistook an enemy drone for a U.S. drone. They didn't react, and thus they got uh, attacked and, and a successful attack. But there have been about 160 attacks on. U.S. bases and Navy ships in the area over the last three months, which the U.S. did not respond to. Um, and then they, there were other deaths. Two Navy SEALs got killed um, trying to stop, investigate some weapons on, on a ship or something like that. So if this is fighting Iran's, what they call the Quds, that's the Iranian um, Revolutionary Guard has these kind of like semi-foreign legion kind of thing they raise up militias other mm -hmm. places ballpark they're saying about seventy thousand of those guys are in um syria um and then there's um 110 120 000 houthi and they the houthi have also um th those are um other people uh in yemen uh, toward the bottom here mm -hmm. um so basically if there was a war against those people um you're looking at maybe two hundred thousand, so it's not an insignificant amount of right. things happening and they're backed by iran and iran's in syria and iraq as well um and then the, they've attacked iran's been using its proxies the houthis to attack the persian gulf shipping um and um basically if this activity hits up it would have to continue to the point where the houthi and the Kurds could not attack um, per, the Persian Gulf shipping. They have to like completely eliminate that at, at a minimum military goal um, because it's affecting things like Tesla. Tesla's shipments of parts to um, the Berlin factory have to go around Africa now and don't go through the, the Persian Gulf. Right. So it's a significant activity affecting supply chain, affecting business and affecting, uh, you know, the, the military. Right. Okay, on to technology and happier topics. Um, <laughs> AI abundance uh, could be like $400 billion in chips by 2027. This was analysis done by um, Pierre Fergu, who also analyzes Tesla. Uh, we can go into the, uh, the more details of his analysis. So the AI data centers are increasing from about $45 billion a day to $400 billion a day, according to his analysis which um, 
might be still slower or a different metric than what Elon was talking about, where he said it would go 10x every six months. But still, you know, Pierre does more research than me uh, and he has a team. So let's just take what he says and see what we're looking at here. Okay. Um, so we're looking at, um, I think, 8.5 million chip shipments in 2024, up from 5 million in uh, 2023. And then he expects that to go to 46 million. 2027. So basically, nearly close to a doubling from 23 to 24. Uh, same for that. Again, accelerating getting faster in 2025, doubling, and then slightly slowing down, but still progressing at a nearly doubling pace um, throughout. And then the the number of chips goes up, um, you know, six times. And it's high in GPUs, low in GPUs, and TPUs. High in GPUs, you can say that's mostly NVIDIA. Low end GPUs, you might say that's AMD, and then other competitors as well. But you can't um, step up to the GPU game, you know. Shortly, you know, Intel was trying to crack that for you know twenty years, couldn't do it. Yeah. Um, Samsung's in there as well. So if you're not already making a really good GPU, you can't kind of keep pace with the guys who are excelling to do that. TPUs, a lot of it's Google, but there's other providers of uh, TPUs which are uh, the uh, tensor processing um, devices, and then other accelerators and other CPUs in AI clusters. Um, so other companies making chips is um, <clears throat> Microsoft, Amazon, Meta, Tesla are trying to make their own chips, just like Google is trying to make their own chips because they don't want to be dependent on upon NVIDIA as much, you know, they want to have their own and also make the ones that they want to have. So these are, you know, huge markets, huge growth, you know, into the foreseeable future that it, I don't think it'll stop the 2027. It keeps continuing. Brian, Brian uh, again, I, I don't have a clue what I'm talking about here. So I have to, I have to go outside to other worlds and, 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 and pull back into this world. Um, we have this kind of analysis being done all the time about various things and people tend to get out way out ahead of their skis. Mm -hmm. um, everybody is saying, oh my gosh, we need this many. And so people start ramp ramping up their capabilities. And then all, and I think Elon even made the point uh, uh, about a year ago that if he says, if he goes out there and says, man, we're going to need jillions of pounds of silicon our, you know, our, our uh, tons of silicon um, and we don't have enough silicon and boy, do we need silicon that all of a sudden we find silicon uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> or, or, or lithium or whatever the whatever the, the product might be, whether it's a manufacturer product or whether it's a raw material. In, in Is there a chance, do you think, that this is going to turn out to be one of those situations where two years from now, all of a sudden there's going to be a glut? Like there is bite, like there is automotive uh, batteries, lithium batteries right now. Yes, yes, it can. <clears throat> so the growth of lithium batteries was real, right? And you went up yeah. like ten x, twenty x, something like that. And then <clears throat> you get to what um, Dan Ives calls an air pocket. An air pocket. Okay. The, the demand kind of like stalls out, right? It's still growing. Yeah. But it stalls out, not as fast as you expected, and then because you and you say got out over your skis, then you know the stock um, had the had the crash and like that, right? right. But um, that doesn't mean that you know definitely the next two years it, it's yeah. stalled for sure because you have um, um, Mark Zuckerberg getting out there saying I'm we're going to have six hundred thousand um, GPUs, you know, high end GPUs by end of this year up yeah. from you know 200,000 or something like that at the beginning of the year right um which was a huge increase from um from last year and then Kuwait announcing one where they can get like 700,000 of the next next generation high end chip for 2025 right so this, so, but this kind of reminds me again of the boom bust situation so right. these guys are not only saying, oh, I'm going to go out and get all of these and there's not enough. But what they're doing is they're buying, in my opinion, in my in in the boom bust env environment, they're going to be buying more than they need 
because they don't want to be left out and they've got the cash available. So they're going to say, look, I don't want to be last in line. I need to be first in line. And so now all everybody's, you know, putting their orders in and then all of a sudden they're not going to need as many as they thought. <laughs> right, right. So we don't know how that plays out. Right, it depends right. upon, like, these orders are all under the assumption that if I have more compute, I can make better AI. Right. Right. I can train faster. I can develop it faster. The The quality of my AI is better when I go through more data, all that kind of thing. Right. <laughs> so this is predicated upon that, which has worked for the last five years. Right. right. It was OpenAI's big bet on right. a research paper by Baidu a few years ago that said, hey, if I just scale up, this thing just keeps getting better and better. It goes from 20% to 50% to 60% to, you know, 99%, right? So, and then it's also the question of, are you going to pay for the AI? You're going to pay more <clears throat> for the AI that's giving you 99% answers versus 98. No. Are you going to pay more for the 99.99? Right, right. You know, is that something that's giving you value? If you're saying ninety nine percent is good enough, yeah, and then you can just have an air pocket. Well, okay, well, we're not going to pay for that anymore, right? You're you're you stall out, right? But for them, <clears throat> for the um, tech companies, <clears throat> they have uh, made their trillions on scaling. No, yeah. you scaled the cloud computing. You know, someone could have, you know, IBM or someone else could have said, um. I have IT data centers. I can be more prudent about how much um, cloud computing I make. Yeah. Right. But the winners, Amazon, everyone else went full steam ahead. Or and, yeah. And make it right. And then can it stall out? Like, okay, my my cloud computing growth went from forty percent per year down to, to to twenty. Right. But I'm there. I got my trillion dollar thing. Right. The fact that I have to, you know, work through a low period is like. I need to have that that dominance, that market share, which was also related to how they won, who were the winners in the internet period. Yeah. Uh, com, the first internet period from 1996 up until like 2000, 2001, right? And then they had a drop, but then it still came back. And, and Amazon's position was, was, was won. So from for the Silicon Valley types, and I'm living in Silicon Valley, it is, it's clear that this, in the tradition is happening, it's clear that the value is there. Two years, three years, it looks really rock solid. Could, you know, it have the growth of 2026 and then 2027, instead of going to 46 from 26, it goes to, to the 30. Yes, it could happen. It could stall out, right? Um, but then if it lasts two years, it's, you last it and then you get back on. You're just like for, for Tesla, okay? A bit of slower demand than we expected on, on EVs. Uh, like that more, but when I bring the cost down, then we'll get it. will be there again. It will keep going, right? So, it's um for the um um the tech companies of the world. You know, this is the game that they've been playing for the last right. Right. five decades, right? Six decades. It's like wave after wave. And you know, when you go to watch the All In podcast with Chama, the billionaire, all that kind of stuff, they view this as Okay, we're replatforming. Mm -hmm. you know, saying okay, I, you know, went from data centers, regular computers to cloud, which is still data centers kind of things, but it's um, um, the cloud was just distributing it and having access to it virtually and stuff like that, right? So that was a replatform thing. It's mm -hmm. the same technology, but I had to like, I had to make the shift. And now mm -hmm. if I go to AI data centers, right, I have to replatform and do this thing, and it puts the old cloud stuff at risk. I may be doing the same thing, but right. if I don't make the shift, I lose all that other stuff. Right. right? So in um, uh, Godfather 1, you have um, Tom Hagen talking to um, uh, Don Corleone, the, the, the main Godfather. And he says, okay, should we get into this um, heroin business or something like that? And he says, um, so right now we have the unions and we have the gambling and those are the best things to have, right? But then if we don't get into this other thing, then we risk to lose everything, not now, but 10 years from now. Now the world's accelerated. I have cloud computing. I have, um, you know, my e-commerce. And those are the best things to have, 
Right. But I don't get into the AI thing. That risk right. everything. Not, and it's actually not, you know, now in the next three years, right? Yes. Yes. I can do it right away, right? right? So that's basically what we're looking at. That that as a defensive move, I got to do. And the, and the amount of money they're spending, okay, ten million dollars per year. Meta, Facebook, they were flushing twenty, thirty million dollars a year on metaverse. Metaverse, yeah. For years, yeah. until they started cutting back on that, they did that and they got nothing out of it. And they still, and now their stock prices is back up because they just stopped losing money at quite the pace. Right it. now they're trying to merge metaverse whatever so so them making big bets that may not pan off because they're throwing off so much profit everywhere else sure. to do and because they're willing to the concern that i must potentially head off losing my golden goose right. that you could take me out you know like they're all looking to you know everyone was looking to take out you know facebook social media everyone looking to take out google search and then it's because okay we tried and now we we failed. So now, okay, we're going to hold off on that. But now I think, oh, hope again. Maybe I can take that out. Maybe I can take out Apple's um, iTunes and stuff like that. Sure. So they're looking to take each other out and also to go to the next level. Because they're all like seeing they went next level last time. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And Apple's at $300 billion. They say, okay, if I do this, blah, 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 I go to $3 trillion. Uh, three, yeah, $3 trillion. Three trillion. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it's, um. so I guess this can be. A hype cycle, but from the Silicon Valley experience, is got to do it anyway. Got to do it anyway. When you're when you're in a boom bust, you don't have a choice. You have to you have to you have if you're if you're going to be alive, you have to participate in the overbuying. You don't really have a choice. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> um, so we talked about the uh, yeah, super servers at the end. Um, how the um, um. The number of chip per server will increase and also talk about the net amount of power. So this right. goes to um, uh, what Elon Musk said that you know, shortage of chips initially and yep. then shortage of power. So then the energy per server goes up 10x. You can see on the right here, 6 megawatt hours to 60 megawatt hours. Total energy per year goes from 450 to 600. So they're trying to um, manage it to um, be more energy efficient, right. but still the power increases because you're still growing things so much. And they talk about install base from 20 million to hundred million. So they talk about hundred million chips because NVIDIA is introducing new chips every six months, you know, twice as good, more energy mm -hmm. efficient. Mm -hmm. So H200 this year, B100 next uh, end of this year, and then two other chips next year. And that will mean like eight generations of chips um, through this four year period. Right. right. And it, so the hundred million install base means, that you'll be turning through, even if okay, we don't go from a hundred million to five hundred million chips. Right, right. I'm cycling through that for so they can get, get to the model of what is Nvidia or AMD, what they make money on. Even if things start plateauing out, then I'm still uh, updating my chips. Just like um, in the old days, you know, you get your x86, your 1886, 8186, 8286 chips for Intel, where you're like having to keep up because things were improving okay. um again a lot of energy needed to serve the users yeah um and then the usage complexity he, he tries to do more detailed analysis of um chip efficiency and it's six times every 18 months every new generation in line uh -huh. with today so again it's going at the power trying to like look at the relationships of what's how things are improving and drilling down on the details of how things are working now and then projecting forward right. on on that. So it, again, just shows that the, the depth of work, they've looked at the whole system to see if everything, you know, makes sense, sanity check stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, so it so implies a data center capex of 1.1 trillion. If, if you're 400 billion on chips, then you're spending nearly three times as much for everything else, which then indicates that um, um, people did not uh the other analysts are under projecting right what, what's ha gonna happen so uh fantastic stuff uh as always um brian we are gonna uh 
uh, split this into two parts. We've already been going a long time. And so we're going to pick it up with uh, some additional material that you have right now. People should go on your website if they want to see it sooner. They can go over to nextbigfuture.com and they can check out Obviously, nowhere close to the detail that we do it here, nowhere close to the amount of back and forth and analysis, but uh, they can get the basics over on your website. Um, and we w obviously encourage everybody to hit like and subscribe and get notified about when part two will be out uh, later this week. Uh, it, very, very interesting stuff, Brian, as always. Thank you. But we'll see you all later. <laughs>